Thank you for joining us today in episode 84 of the Pool Chasers podcast. As always, our mission is to help educate and inspire in the form of a podcast. Our live tour continues this week in Orlando, Florida. We talk a little bit about it at the end of the episode, but we will be interviewing Lucas Congdon of Lucas Lagoons. He is the star of the hit TV show Insane Pools. We are looking forward to this interview as we have wanted to have Lucas on the show since the very beginning. It's going to be from 5 to 7 at Theater South Playhouse on Friday, February 14th. We look forward to seeing you all there. In this episode, we get the opportunity to interview our friend Tony Arredondo. Tony has been a big supporter of ours from the beginning, and we are very excited to finally get him on the show. He runs a pool service and remodeling company called the Pool Guys of Tampa Bay in Tampa, Florida. He's also the president of the FSPA Tampa Chapter. Tony tells us the unique story of how he got into the industry, and we discuss how the foreclosure market provided him with rapid growth when he was first starting out. So much so that he had to stop taking on clients at one point to readjust his business strategy, something we did several times at Brothers Pool Service. We also had a great discussion about an organization he is involved in called the Tampa Group. This group is made up of different people in the industry who are experts in their fields. They all use one another to give their clients the best customer service possible by making sure the right guy is in the backyard to do each job. It's a great way of coming together to lift the image of our industry and support one another so that everyone is successful. We had an awesome conversation, so stay tuned until the end. Please enjoy this episode with Tony Arredondo of the Pool Guys of Tampa Bay, tampapoolpro.com. Welcome to your go-to podcast for the pool and spa industry. My name is Tyler Rasmussen. And my name is Greg Diafania. And this is the Pool Chasers Podcast. All right. Well, thank you so much, Tony, for joining us on the podcast today. We really appreciate your time and really look forward to this conversation with you. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So let's jump right into it. Um, can you introduce yourself to the to the listeners? Well, I'm Tony Arredondo. I'm, uh, I'm the... Managing partner of the Pool Guys of Tampa Bay, tampapoolpro.com. Very good. Well, thanks again. Um, so as we normally do, we want to start from the very beginning, and we want to really get to know you and want the listeners to get to know you and how you got into the pool business. But let's go way back, and maybe you could just share with us, you know, how you got started as a little little guy getting into the world. As a little Tony. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> little Tony. <laughs> Well, I'm somewhat of a military brat, so um, I was actually born on the uh, naval base in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, then we picked up from there, and, and my dad was transferred over to Texas. We were living in Lubbock for a little bit, and him doing some things, and moved down to Austin. My mom actually worked for the, the Department of Energy, so both of them together were being shipped all over the you know all over the south uh, southeast. So, um, you know, we spent some time in Lubbock, spent quite a bit of time in Austin. Uh, from there, we she was shipped up to uh, Chattanooga, which happens to be her hometown. And she was doing some work there with the DOE, with the, the Tennessee Valley Authority. Then from there, my dad got the call to head down to South Florida. And that was probably one of the most memorable days as, as a young kid, because we were like, oh, we're moving to Disney World. We're moving to Disney World. <laughs> yeah, Boca Raton and Delray Beach, far from being Disney World. So. <laughs> oh, really? What's it like over there? Where Delray and Boca? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't have a good. I had a bad uh, experience with Florida, so hopefully you can enlighten me <laughs> throughout this. Well, I, there story. was really nothing special about uh, Delray at the time. Um, maybe surfing. I learned how to. You know, that's when I first started surfing, so I was probably seven, eight years old. Oh, nice. Um, picked that up. Um, then we then we bought another house over in Boca, and no sooner than we were. We bought the house in Boca. Then my dad gets transferred up here to McDill. And we're like, oh, okay. So we, we were just getting settled down there. Everything was going great. Then all of a sudden this big shift. And and I can tell you the the dynamics of East Coast people versus West Coast people was was huge. Because mm -hmm. we came up to McDill for a visit. And then we spent some time on the beach. There were no waves. We, I was like, dad, I'm like, oh, this, is, this is lame. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, you just got to deal with it, son. Um, the people were the people were different. Like down, you know, down south, it's it's more laid back, it's more casual. Up here, very very busy, 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 busy. And um, he goes, "Well, you're just going to have to adapt." I said, "Well, I guess I'll have to adapt." So we got up here to Tampa. We ended up buying, uh, living in St. Petersburg. I was I grew up in St. Petersburg, and 
spent all my time over there, and then pretty much, uh, pretty much the rest is history. Um, I met my wife, and uh, believe it or not, I met my wife online back in 2001, and we've been married what eight, almost 18 years now. Damn, what website yeah. what were, were you guys back on? Then? <laughs> Dude, let me tell you, it was it was uh, Matchmaker dot com, and I we I started off with DSL. And I don't know if you guys were re- remember being on computers back in the early two yeah. thousands when you know it, you'd go to do a download and the picture was like, yeah. <laughs> and took like twenty minutes. So, and I actually had one of the first Kodak digital cameras. I still actually have it, and it would only hold four, I think, five megapixel pictures, and that was it. <laughs> oh and man! So you know, most people were going over to. Um, to, to Ecker Drugs or the local drugstore, and they would take their um, their negatives and they would load them up to um, a floppy floppy disk. disk. When we still had the three and a half inch <laughs> floppy disks. Yeah, <laughs> I'll take those over CDs all day. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, 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 definitely. Because you can't scratch them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, just don't send them next to a speaker magnet. You know, you'll you'll, you'll never see anything on there again. <laughs> um, the first picture of your wife you saw was it drop the the screen oh, dropping yeah, yeah, like yeah. that? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was a glamour <laughs> shot. So back in the day, they used to have these glamour shot pictures. You know, oh. you, the the girls would go into these little professional uh, studios and they would, you know take <laughs> these awesome. fake poses and you know do all kinds of weird stuff. So that came through, and I'm like, oh no, not another glamour shot. Because the history with online dating back in the late '90s, early 2000s was it was just bad. It was really bad because. You know, they'd send you a glamour shot, and you'd go meet them at like Bennigan's or uh, or Steakhouse or something, and it's just like, whoa, what, when was this picture taken? Like, you know, fourteen <laughs> years ago. <laughs> oh, that is so funny. <laughs> and, and, and some of the guys out here were some of the guys out here were actually just, just known for that too, because they were like, oh, well, you look you look just like your picture. I go, yeah, because it's me. Go, no, no, no. There's some guys sending me pictures, and. There, it's it's like they were taken like ten years ago. Oh, I go so, kind of like a glamour shot. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's oh. like, why is your profile picture a Snapchat photo where you're wearing <laughs> bunny ears and? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so my uh, my wife. So I, I reach out to her and I, I, I send her because you could they had the instant messaging on the apps themselves, so you could send the person. Hey, got your picture. Um, do you have any other pictures? Oh yeah, sure. Let me send one over uh, of me and my daughter on the beach. I'm like okay so i was kind of fishy about that but it was a clean you know nice they were in khakis and white shirts and stuff and coming <laughs> on beach there and i'm like oh perfect I go how long ago was that picture she goes oh like uh, eight months ago i go perfect we gotta meet and then <laughs> we we met at bennigan's and the rest was history after that man that's cool man yeah yeah that was really people, cool yeah they're freaked out when they hear like you met your wife on the internet yep sure did Huh, I think it's a lot more common these days. Um, I think mm-hmm. 2001. That's that's pretty. Uh, man, you you were one of the pioneers. Yeah, you know, yeah to kind of really get that yeah, started. Definitely one of the pioneers. I mean, I was on I, because I was at the time I was a marketing director for a mortgage company, and I had no time. I mean, I was working morning, noon, and night, and. I was like, so this girl came in and goes, oh, you should, you should try Yahoo dating service. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm not going to meet somebody on Yahoo. Yeah. She goes, no, 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 no. It's an da- online dating thing. Yahoo. I'm like, oh, okay. She goes, let me, let me set up your profile. And she did all that stuff. So, so. And then after that, oh, I was man. hooked. And, no, and then um, more dating sites progress on the internet. And then, you know, you would load a profile here, load a profile there. And, you know, it, it, it was crazy. It was, yeah, it, was a, it was literally the wild, wild west. There you go. <laughs> of the internet dating world was, was online dating. I feel like right. you should submit that story to them or something. You're probably on TV. Yeah, you, we might try, you know what? My wife <laughs> tried great to reach marketing out to for them, them. let them know, and she can't find because they keep they keep thinking it's Match.com, and no, it was Matchmaker.com. Their logo was like a little match, oh. was, you know, on fire, <laughs> and she can't find anyone associated with that with that particular website. So she's just like, eh, hey, whatever. Yeah. yeah, we've got bigger things to worry about right now. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, I, I'm kind of curious how things were growing up with uh, just being a kind of an army brat and your dad being in the military. I'm assuming you just kind of went from base to base, um, government living and all that stuff. What was it like? Was your dad super strict? No, my no, my dad wasn't real super strict. And it wasn't that we were going from like base to base because my dad was my, my father was in the Navy and his position in the Navy, you know, 
when he first got in, of course, we're, we're on the we're on the ships and stuff. But then it was more uh, desk work later on. But yeah, it wasn't real strict. It was hard, you know, because I hear a lot of people say, "Oh, well, you know, like my daughter, she was was born here in Tampa, and she's had friends since you know uh, preschool." I didn't have that growing up, and a lot of military ki- a lot of kids growing up in the military don't have that. Where you've got friends that you've had, you know, since first grade, second grade. It's like, all right, I'm I'm here this year, or I'm here for you know part of this semester. Now I'm now I'm gone and stuff. So, um, but overall, because my family was pretty huge, my mom had six sisters and seven brothers. Oh my so god! Yeah, <laughs> my cousins are in the hundreds now. Um, growing up in that 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 big of a family, you you always had somebody to talk to. You were you always had somebody that. No matter if we were in Tennessee, Texas, or Georgia, you could reach out to your cousins. Everybody was visiting everybody, would have family family reunions, things like that. So it was that kind of took the place of being steady at a school for, you know, all through, you know, kindergarten or, or elementary school and middle school and high school. So so it wasn't it wasn't bad. My um my, my parents were great, had a great childhood. We did a lot of uh, t- a lot of your typical s- southern slash western type lifestyles we did a lot of hunting a lot of camping um got into things um i was always in trouble with my other male counterpart cousins because we were picking on the younger kids and stealing their stuff and breaking things so you know the, the, the moms <laughs> and stuff, aunts yeah. were always you know chasing us around and stuff but um great great memories great cookouts the food absolutely phenomenal um yeah you can't beat the food man that is, I have my grandma has eleven brothers and sisters, so in a similar situation, they're from like Robert E. Lee, Texas, a small town, and yeah, Kansas, yeah, and these like yeah. I used to yeah, go. And you don't see that anymore. You don't see family. <laughs> no. you, you'll you'll have like two or three kids, and you're done. But yeah, yeah back in the day, they were. I know. Like Pop them out. Things. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's like, well, what did, you, what did your grandfather do? I go, my my granddad worked at the Coca Cola Company. Um, in, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and drove around in a hot pink Cadillac. Ooh, nice. Yeah. Now that's <laughs> cool. A that's a baller Cadillac. right there. That's pinky. Then, <laughs> you want to guess his name? William Wallace. What? William Kid Wallace. you not. My mom's oh, maiden name is Wallace. My, grand, my grandfather's <laughs> name was William Wallace. Oh, Any my. relation? <laughs> uh, they're Scots. I know that. But, you know. <laughs> That's you know. cool, man. Those family reunions are fun, man. I, I grew up going to those big family reunions and the food. You can't beat the food, but it's just really yeah. fun getting around everybody and it's a cool family vibe for sure. That yeah. that oh, southern food, that southern fun thing and just is shenanigans and stuff that go on. Yeah. So what love. do you? So what do you and your uh, family right now? What do you guys do for fun? So we mostly believe it or not, because everything that's going on with my daughter and stuff, and that's fine. Um, but normally we we spend a lot of time on the boat. We, we love going on the boat. We, we, we've got a 25 foot center console, uh, with T tops and we're, we're, we're constantly, if we're not, if we're not working, we're on the boat now, right now, because of the temperature, you know, Anita will not touch the water because it's, it's below 85 degrees. Um, <laughs> but the other time, you know, we're, we're, we're on the boat and if we're not on the boat, we're dedicated to the business. So it's just business has been really, really good lately. And just everything that's going on, we're, we're even, you know, just dying for a little bit of free time on the boat, but that's not going to happen for, for a little bit. And that's okay. But we find what we find ways to, to balance that. Um, albeit have the, you know, I've got two, uh, two grandkids, so they'll come over, they'll swim for a little bit. Um, even though the water's, you know, 65 degrees, kids, they don't care. I'm going to get in a pool. No, no, I'm getting in a pool. Jump in, buddy. Have fun. <laughs> I'm not coming. Um, so, you know, we'll spend a lot of time at the house, you know, around the pool, eating out things like, or having barbecues and stuff like that. Very good. That's crazy. The water actually gets down to, or gets up to 85 degrees in the summertime. Like in the oh, ocean, no, the water over here gets up to like a hundred and my pool, because I've got a black, I've got a black bottom pool, 114 degrees because mm-hmm. I get my, um, what? my house faces East West. So my pool gets maybe, eight to 10 hours of sunshine on it all day long and on a black finish pool. Yeah. It's, it's blistering hot, Damn. blistering hot. That's crazy hot. No, I think I was more asking cause you guys were, you were talking about being out on the boat and they mm-hmm. didn't want, I thought because they didn't want to be out on the boat cause the water was, um, under 85 degrees. 
Are you, do you ride in the boat on a lake or in the ocean? Oh no, no, we're in the bay. We're actually we're we're actually if you were to, I wish I had a map, but if, uh, South Tampa is kind of like its own little finger between the uh, Tampa Bay on the west side, and then you've got the another peninsula of St. Petersburg, and then we've got the other uh, bay that's on our east side before you hit the mainland of uh, Florida again. So we're kind of like this big finger um, that, that kind of shoots out. So we're kind of like the thumb of the glove. If you ever look at a map of Tampa Bay, the, the you see the glove is St. Petersburg and you see this little thumb right there. That's, you know, that's, that's South Tampa. Oh. And so we spend a lot of time on the Bay. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try to get out to the actual Gulf every once in a while, but yeah, I mean, the Bay temperatures here, they can get up, you know, 90, 93 degrees. Mm. Um, the Gulf will be a little bit cooler. Uh, it just, you know, just depends on the tides and how they're coming in. If we if we get a little bit of rainfall, if we get a torrential downpour in the middle of July, it can, it can cool the bay down to, you know, maybe 85 degrees. But anything lower than that, my wife doesn't want to get in the water. She's just, just yeah. like, <laughs> that's don't get different. me near the water. I'm not launching the boat. I'm not helping you put get it back on the trailer. That's all on you. I'm like, okay. <laughs> that's right. much different than the uh, West Coast beach temperatures, huh? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but I don't, you're freezing. You're, the Pacific gets down to what 60 degrees it's or cold man it stays even cold in, even yeah, in the summertime even in the it's summertime freezing. it's cold oh yeah no 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 i don't think i could be able to, uh, <laughs> no way yeah That's it's hard crazy. getting in that water but we do have good surfing waves That's oh yeah yeah sure. yeah your surface your surface is <laughs> is, the, is the bomb man yeah man, I, don't, I just don't know if i could just it's bad enough down here if you go on the you know we head over to the east coast to go surf i got a i got a slide a wetsuit on right I, I don't know if i could do that every time i go out yeah you know? they they all wear wetsuits for sure the surfers yeah it's crazy yeah. Crazy. That's fun, man. I, I grew up boogie boarding and all kinds of stuff on those things. And so we, we learned how to surf in Hawaii, which was cool, Greg and I. But um, yeah, and I went out to East Coast of Florida from our honeymoon. I was going to go boogie boarding and I was like, then I got to the, the ocean. And I'm like, yeah, this these waves aren't going to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> like yeah. Crashing yeah, you guys right are used to the... like 10, 10, to, 10 to 20 footers and stuff. Over here, we're, yeah. you know, we're, we're jumping up and down if we if we got an 8-foot swell. I like, know. Yeah. And then yours crash much closer to the shoreline, too. It's like if you yeah, want to ride a yeah, wave, it's yeah, going to be like yeah. you know, lot, two lot feet. Breakers, <laughs> a lot of leg breakers. Lot That's lot awesome. <laughs> You got you. You guys in Cal, the guys in California. You guys, you guys paddle out like four hundred yards, and you're riding all the way back to shore. Exactly. It's like okay, <laughs> here comes, here comes a set. Nope, nope, nope. Okay, we got one. All right, good. Dude, since we're on this topic, because it's just so crazy. Over the weekend, I was watching uh, a newer surf documentary by Red Bull, right. and um, of course, they're kind of like chasing the Maverick waves, Southern California, and they're in Hawaii, Indonesia, and stuff like this, but. Um, this dude hit this freaking it's like 40 foot wave and um fell on it which when you fall on like 40 foot wave you're pretty much supposed to die <laughs> yeah like that's yeah. just kind of the way yeah. it is but or not walk or not walk ever again yeah, yeah. because it, it was saying that like when that wave comes down like most of the time like the ocean decides to keep you because of that that weight and force that pushes you down but there's like no explanation but it like somehow got vacuumed up to the surface really fast and like wow. nothing, like not a scratch, nothing. Wow. And uh, his brother had died or something like that surfing and thought that that's who he had to thank for it. But I like just watching this wave, you're like, what the freaking <laughs> heck? Why yeah, would you yeah. do that? That sounds like his, bo his board come through solid. No, <clears throat> wasn't snapped in half or anything. I don't know so much about the board, but they just showed like kind of a side view um, of the wave and it's just, and then he goes down and like, Oh shit, man, that's, that's it. <laughs> yep. Game see over. Yeah. That's the risk. Yeah, you, we take watch, you know, we'll that. watch some of those shows from, from over here and we see these 40, you know, 50 foot waves and we're like, God, wow, wow. just the adrenaline on that. You know, I, I could just imagine, you know? So yeah. And this guy is the first one too. He I did an acid drop. Like you would a skateboard into a wave off a helicopter. So it was Ugh. probably like a, maybe like this was a little bit smaller, like 15, 20 feet in Hawaii, yeah. Oahu. And he's like on the side of this helicopter and he, he doesn't make it a few times, but he lands it in craziest conditions, super windy, overcast, raining like crazy <laughs> and like lands us. I'm like, dude, you, you must have like a death wish, but somehow hmm. like got it. But guardian angel. Cool. His yeah, brother. exactly. Yeah, his brother. Right. That's, That's it. Crazy, man. Nuts. 
We're very excited to introduce a new sponsor today, the leak detection experts at Anderson Manufacturing. As much as leaks can be a headache, they're an unavoidable part of maintaining a pool. Anderson Manufacturing's goal is to help you turn those leak problems into profits. As the industry leak experts for over 30 years, Anderson Manufacturing is trusted by professionals to understand and respond to their needs with innovative quality solutions. From the popular Anderson straight sided test plugs to advanced electronics like Leak Track 2400 or Leakalyzer, Anderson has the equipment, repair supplies, training, and support you need to be successful. Plus, they're always available to offer helpful advice, whether that's talking you through a tough job or making equipment decisions. If leak detection is the right opportunity for you, give Anderson a call at 1-800-348-1316 to get started with a custom equipment and training package. Or you can browse their complete line of leak solutions at leaktools.com. Even if you choose to have someone else do your leak work, make sure that they're using Anderson equipment to get the job done right. As a special thank you to all our listeners, they will add a free set of LeakMaster products to your next order when you enter the code POOLCHASERS during checkout. To find out more, please click the link below. So, um, heard you got a pretty cool in, uh, story on how you got into the pool industry. You want to share that with us? Yeah. Um, so, when my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer, um, at the time I was uh, marketing director for a local telecommunications company, and I was on FMLA, of course. And my time was running out. And you know, so we're, we're like, okay, what are we going to do? My wife's got, you know, surgeries left. So I go to my VP and I'm like, listen, my wife's got a, at least four more surgeries left. I know I'm going to be out at least another eight to 10 weeks, maybe. I said, um, I'm going to have to step down, step away. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to come back. Uh, at this point, I've got enough money and savings. I've got kick-ass 401k plan that if something really, really bad happens, I've got a backup there. I said, but, uh, you know, my wife, my wife needs me. I've got to be there for her. My daughter needs me. I've got to be there for her. And he, you know, totally understand, totally amicable. There were no issues whatsoever. Um, so I resigned from, from the company, sit down and talk to my wife. She's like, okay, so now what are you going to do when you grow up? I'm like, oh, I said, I'm like almost ready to retire. Now I've got to figure out what I'm going to do again. <laughs> so, you know, my, my, my younger brother, he's living over in St. Petersburg and he's just a one pole pro, pool pro. And he's like, have you ever thought about getting in the pool cleaning business? And I said, what? I go, no, 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 that's not for me. That's not for me. He goes, look, you're old, you're fat, you're, <laughs> you're out of shape <laughs> because you got money to start something. He goes, why don't you do that marketing stuff that you do? Go sit down and write a business plan and projections and things like that. And come back and talk to me. He goes, and here's, here, here's, here's my rep. Here's my guy's number over at the pool supply place over in Largo. Call him and they'll, they'll talk you through some stuff too. So I went home, talked to my wife and I'm like, yeah, you know, what are your thoughts about this? She goes, you're too old to be a pool guy. <laughs> Are you freaking kidding me? Can I hear something positive? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I just, I just, you know, quit my job to hang out with you, and now you're you're calling me an old man. <laughs> now, mind you, <laughs> I'm in my early forties, so it wasn't too too bad. Um, so I sit down and I wrote a business plan up. I contacted. Uh, Curtis Lateral at uh, SCP Pool Supply over in Largo. Got some pricing on some things. Talked to some other guys about how they're billing. You know, what do you what do you like about this job? What do you hate about this job? Um, just got a lot of input from them. And believe it or not, a, a majority of it, maybe ninety percent, was positive. Guys are, you know, I've I've been doing this for twenty years. I love doing this. I don't want to do anything else. Um, some guys were some guys were college educated. Some guys were high school dropouts, and almost like the high school dropouts were were more professional than the college guys that <laughs> that had, you know had a bachelor's degree. So I'm like, well, that's just that doesn't make any sense. But it's just all in what learning about what all they put into the business and what they wanted to get out of the business. A lot of them, you know, a lot of the college guys were stoners, and they were like, hey, whatever, I don't care, man. It's a great job. It's a good gig. I don't have to report to anybody. Yet, yet, yet versus most of the guys that were high school dropouts were like, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm doing great. I'm making something of this business. You, you need, you got any questions, feel free to call me. I'm like, wow, this is great. Um, 
So went back to my wife with the business plan, my five-year projection. She's like, yeah, that's not exactly the kind of cash I was thinking about. I said, well, listen, it, it can go other places. There's other things that we can, we can do with the business. She goes, go do what you got to do. If you think you can do this, go do it. And I said, all right, I'm on it. So did a little bit of marketing. My brother helped me out with um, passing a couple of accounts over to us. We started off with eight accounts um, and had this real estate broker agent call me and said, hey, I've got a pool that's black. There's no equipment there. I need some help. I'm like, listen, I'm in Florida. You got to have a you have to be a contractor in order to replace any type of equipment. I don't know anything about black pools because most of the, the, the eight accounts we had were screened in and they were barely 12,000 gallons. You know, we were in and out of there in 10, 15 minutes. So she goes, just nobody's answering. No one's answering my calls. No one's helping me. If you could just go look at it. She goes, I, I don't care what you, what you have to do to get it done, but I just need to get it done. I said, fine. So met her out there. And she was right. Pool black as night. There's fish in the pool. I'd never seen fish in a pool before, but apparently... In Pinellas <laughs> County, they add fish. They were adding fish to the foreclosed houses that had pools that were turning black to eat the mosquito larvae. And I mean, it was like a at least an eighteen pound big mouth bass rolling around in there. What? Like, well, I was like, I'm gonna go grab my fishing pole. Let's get some fish. Um, tell you, yeah, it was crazy, absolutely crazy. So, so they were eating the mosquito larvae and the I'm sorry, the tadpoles from the frogs. Um, so she goes, okay, well, here's where the pool equipment's supposed to be. I look down, there's six pipes sticking out of the ground. Uh, there's nothing on the wall, no kind of, con- there's no intermatic panel. There's no automation panel. There's not even a, a, a T-104 in a box on the wall. I mean, it's just bare naked. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I need to figure out what we're going to do here. I said, can you give me a couple of days? Let me make some calls. Maybe I've got some other people that can come in and kind of, you know, I can persuade them to come in and fix and get this stuff going for you. So went back to talk to Curtis. Um, got a couple of names. My brother had a couple of people, got a couple of their names, finally met with one guy who was a licensed contractor at the time. Um, Todd, and I do not remember Todd's name, but that's a whole other thing. Um, Todd came in, met me at the pool, said, listen, this is easy. He goes, we just need to drain the pool down, wash it, make it look pretty again, install all new equipment. He goes, we could have this pool up and running in three or four days. I said, there's no way. Because I'd never touched, you know, most of the pools that we were doing, the, the, the eight that we had, a little algae here and there, never dealt with anything massive like this. So sure enough, he said, I got you. He goes, Here's, here, here are the numbers. Uh, you're going to need to present them to the lady and see what, see what kind of, you know, see what kind of feedback you get from her. I'm like, okay. So I gave her the numbers and she's like, is that it? <laughs> <laughs> when, what? She goes, is that all you're charging? I go, well, yeah. And she goes, no, honey, let me stop you right there. And I'm like, wow, no, what did I do? She goes, no, no, you didn't do anything wrong. This is a, uh, this is a government foreclosed home, Fannie Mae. And I'm like, okay, I'm familiar with Fannie Mae. And she said, you know, there's certain prices that we can charge. And she goes, I'm going to tell you what those prices are. And she goes, you can't share them with anybody else. And I go, I, I, I won't. She goes, I like you. You're you're, you seem like a very good guy. You're level-headed. You haven't steered me wrong. You showed up when you said you were going to show up. So she showed me the price for the, for the drain and wash. It was almost $800 more than what we quoted. Showed me the price for the equipment. That was about $500 more than what we quoted. Showed me the price for the service. Now, now back then, you know, we were picking up accounts for $99.95 a month. It's super easy. No issues there. We were, we were almost, a, almost at 150 a month. I'm like, are you kidding me? Wow. So she goes, she said, okay, go ahead and do it. Um, just let me know who to write the check out to. I said, well, unfortunately, I'm not licensed. So you have to, you know, have to, you'll have to go through this other gentleman and stuff. She goes, I don't care who I write the check out to as long as I'm dealing with you. I said, okay, that's fine. So Todd went in there and had everything done just like he said in three days. Pool was filled on the fourth day. She shows up. She ju- she's just amazed. She's like, oh my gosh. They even rinsed the deck down, you know, uh, j- just liquid uh, cowhide the deck and wash it off and stuff. She's like, oh my God, this was beautiful. This is absolutely beautiful. They're, how did you guys do this in three days? I'm like, well, this guy Todd is really, really good. She goes, all right, 
because I got like 50 or 60 more and I got 40 after that coming. And then went, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> she goes, yes, I've got, if you're, if you guys are willing to sit down and work up the numbers on all of these, she goes, I'll send you the complete list tonight. Some are here in South St. Petersburg. A lot are, are up in North Tampa. A couple are in Riverview. Just go, if you need a week to go and look at everything, take a week to go and look at everything and come back to, and get back to me with, with, with pricing for each one. I need a quote for each, each pool. She goes, with everything, complete, done. I'm like, oh, go reach out to the Todd guy. Whew. Todd gets me in with another mortgage broker who happens to do the same thing for Fred, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, Todd took me under his wing and probably by the fourth or fifth job, I was basically handling it all. I was doing the, you know, draining the pools, pulling the plugs, washing them down, filling them back up, replacing all the equipment, installing new timers, getting involved in automation. I'm, so, so by the time I was on my 150th pool, <laughs> I, think <laughs> I, I think I had a, a good idea of what I was doing. Um, but then going, so on the flip side of that, once we got the pools up and running, we had to maintain those pools. So here I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to get all the, the drain and washes done. I'm working sun up to sun down seven days a week. I'm trying to get the pools, try to keep the pools clean. Um, reach out to a couple of friends. Oh yeah. I, I'll, I know how to clean pools. I'll come and help you clean pools. I'm like, okay, great. Um, one guy ended up coming to work for me. He did a really good job. Um, we had a falling out a little bit later. Um, but then the technicians that I have, that I still have now, uh, Terry, who's my lead repair tech and my lead service tech, um, Brian and Emilio, those guys have been with me pretty much since for about nine years now and huge, huge help. Um, I owe a lot of stuff to those guys because they actually helped me out in a, in a, in a bunch of binds when we were going through the maintenance side. Um, but yeah, it just, just, it was mind blowing to go from eight accounts to I think we ended up with 300 and something at the end, at the end of like 2014 and it was still growing from there. So, but absolutely crazy. Sorry to, sorry to go on a, on a, on a tangent there. No, I love that. That's one of the craziest stories I've personally ever heard for, there's a lot of things to that. I mean, even just thinking about the people that you were surrounded with and how you were like, is the community, like the pool, community just that strong out there where you're at? Because it just seemed like you decided, you know, from a friend made a recommendation about getting into the pool business. And it just seemed like he was steering you in the right direction. And the people that you contacted after that were pretty helpful. I don't know if it's the way you were telling the story, but it seemed like pretty freaking smooth. Well, yeah. And I mean, it seemed pretty smooth at the time, but you know, it, it was a lot of stuff I had to learn on my own. You know, I went to, after being in it for probably six to eight months because I saw all the classes about, I'll oh, become CPO certified, uh, become a Florida pool professional and this and that. And I'm like, okay, what is all that? Because I was slammed. I'm, I'm trying to get all this work done. Um, and I wanted to go take these courses and stuff. And a lot of people were helpful, but they were only help. You could tell they only wanted to give you so much information. And then after that, it's like, yeah. I don't want to give you more that they didn't want to seem like they seem like they didn't want to give you more because they didn't want you to maybe learn more than they knew, or they didn't want you stealing work from them or something. So, um, you know, but most of the, anybody that I came in contact with, I'm like, listen, I've got more work that I know what to do with. I can pass some stuff off to you if you help me do this and help me do that. And they're like, Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You know, until it came time for them to go to do the work and they just never showed up and, so I had to end up doing everything myself, but you know, the, the, the guy, Todd, uh, my brother, um, Terry, Brian, Emilio, I, we just had the, we just had a great team there. Um, so yeah, it, it, helpful. Yes. But they were still, you know, some outside of that, outside of that little circle that we had wasn't really, you know, not a lot of follow through with stuff. Hey, try this, try this, try this. And then you'd call them back to follow up and they're gone. So um, that was then the now, and we can get into that later, but now, yeah, the, the, the industry here in, in, in Tampa would, especially with the group that we have, absolutely wonderful. Right. And I know a lot of things have changed, you know, from then to now, but 
Was it easier back then? Like you said, it was crazy. You know, you're juggling, you know, routes and repairs and all these different things. You think it was, it's more difficult now because there's so many distractions like social media and, you know, all the different things that get tacked onto your business that wasn't really around then. I mean, you have to stay on top of, you know, websites and all the other marketing things that you got to do inside an office. Was it easier to kind of get some of that stuff done back then, you think? I, no, I would actually say it's easier now hmm. because, you know, 2010, 2011, 2012, there weren't, there, I was running routes out of Excel spreadsheet. Um, we had PayPal, which was good for billing because back then, you know, there was, you know, your regular PayPal, like you need to buy something off of eBay, but then there was PayPal business that could do your invoicing and stuff like that. There was no automated invoicing back then. So, you know, I'm having to, um, work off of a, an Excel spreadsheet for all our, for, for all of the routes. Um, I'm actually pulling up, um, now back then Google maps wasn't real popular. So it was map quest back in the day. Uh, oh yeah. So, yeah. Take yeah. you like the most random so spots there, ever. You'd print a map out. So we'd, pr- <laughs> we'd make a big map and then I'd print some other maps out and you know, you're doing the whole thumbtack thing going, okay, here's this one. All right. So, <laughs> so th- there was no route optimization back then. Um, there were no routing software. There was no routing software back then. Um, so as soon as, uh, you know, 2014 rolled around, I found this scheduling program at home uh, office depot where I could actually load my customer database in there and it would route everything for me, but it was, there was no cloud and, you know, we'd had to have, we had it on two laptops because if God forbid one crashed, we didn't, <laughs> we didn't have a backup. Or yeah. <laughs> you could put it on a thumb drive, but you'd still have to download software. Oh, it was a nightmare. Um, so back then busy very very busy um a lot of busy work especially on the back on the back end office um i saw a lot of companies come and go because they just couldn't handle the back end office portion of the business and that's sending out your invoices you know collecting making sure that you know clients that knew that you were there leaving you know leaving the door cards i think i've got a i've got a door card floating around here um but just the little things that were very tedious and took forever. Um, it, it was it was mind blowing. I mean, there were nights where I, I or days where I only had six hours of sleep because I was up, you know, doing routes where I'm trying to in, get all the customers' invoices. Because we were one good things we were doing invoicing online at the time. We never we didn't not once did I ever go into this mailing out a paper invoice, waiting for a paper check or anything. Everything everybody got except for maybe two of the older clients that were in their 80s who didn't get online or pay with credit cards. Um, everybody was invoiced online. So that was, that was great, but it just took forever. And even with the real estate agency that or broker that I was working with 300 pools, how long do you think it takes to sit down and invoice 300 pools? Because there's no automation anywhere online where you can just, you know, say, boom, go send them out. Back then that was all manually entered on the computer. Yeah. Did somebody, yeah. did somebody recommend that to you back then? I mean, cause that's not quite What's common, that? you know, invoicing online. How did you know to do that? Just- um, well, just based on some other stuff that, w- that we were doing just with regular bills. Um, I'm like, there's gotta be a way where we don't have to send someone a paper check or, or hmm. send them a pay, you know, print out an invoice online and then mail it to them and do all that. And, and then, um, I was flipping through, um, something online and a little PayPal thing came up and says, oh, I'm tired of mailing out your business invoices. And I clicked on the link, read about it. And I'm like, Oh, this is fantastic. And I mean, we pretty much had that from day one. That's so cool. We, we didn't have to really worry about the whole mailing of, of anything. So. That's pretty innovative for this industry back in 2010. I mean, that's yes, it was. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, just at the time, just, just trying to look for some kind of routing software. And we were, and I was looking at all kinds of different scheduling, software things and this and that it was just it was just mind-numbing that we didn't have the technology back then were you around um paypal when they were doing that in the beginning where if you like referred a friend or something you got like a dollar or twenty dollars or something like that I, i you know i don't recall doing any of that and stuff i mean if if i if anybody said hey we're looking to start doing some uh some billing online you know i'd recommend you know definitely go check out paypal um, but I, I don't believe we got any referral. You missed your kickback. kickback yeah. Like well, I thought I just recently saw a documentary with Elon Musk and they're talking about the earlier days oh, of PayPal yeah. 
And they were kind of the pioneers of that sort of marketing strategy, which helped, you know, grow PayPal to what it, to what it is today. And one of those things was, you know, like recommend a friend or something and get mm. like ten, a dollar or however much money added to your <laughs> account or something. And now it's pretty like common, but back then that was like, you know, we say back then, but it's pretty crazy. <laughs> no, like ten years ago. Ten years, yeah. <laughs> but it's pretty freaking crazy. Like how much, uh, how much has changed in just the last 10, 15 years. And when you're talking about back to 2001, so much has changed since then. I mean, yeah. everything yeah. there's been, I feel like there's been more changes in the last 20 years than like prior to that in the last, you know, thousand years. Well, yeah, just the, just the advancement and just, 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 just human technology in itself. It's just, it's just been incredible. And, you know, when we talk about, you know, what we're sitting here talking about t- 2010, and I mean, just look at where we've been in the last five years with yeah. new routing software, um, new construction software. I mean, things that have just made all of our lives so much easier. And it's just, it's it just the technology in the, in the swimming pool industry has just grown by leaps and bounds. And I'd say within the last five years alone. What do you think is your favorite technology like today in the pool industry? That's help. That that's a tough help one. help save you some time. Yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, route routing for sure. You know, I know there's different there's different programs out here. Pull track, skimmer, pay the pull man, jobber, um, all are all are absolutely wonderful. Um, I know we got involved with pull track back in late 2013, early 2014, um, and we I just thought that that was the the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, met the guys <laughs> over at uh, at the pool show. Everything under the sun. Um, just told them, listen, I've been, you guys know me. We, we we're, we're constantly calling each other and talking to each other. And I finally got to put a you know a face with a, a name, and it was just unbelievable, unbelievable. And then along came Skimmer, uh, and then uh, Jobber, and then Pay the Pool Man. It's just and then the pay like I like Pay the Pool Man because it's all incorporated into one. Um, pool Track is great. We just use it for the technicians. It's not the 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 the, the GUI side of it's good. The the user interface side of it's pretty easy. Um, you know, my techs were kind of you know they were fighting it at first because it was change. It was technology it was working half the time for them. It wasn't the other half. Um, but once once they got it rolled out and once the tech started you know learning how to use it. They're like, Tony, this is awesome. Thank you for not having me fill out door cards anymore. And door cards are blowing away and, and things. <laughs> yeah, right. Man, All up against the fence. <laughs> <laughs> we're also very excited to introduce our new sponsor, Primate Pool Tools today. You may have seen them at a trade show or all over Instagram, but we wanted to talk about the quality of these poles. The Primate Poles are the first carbon fiber poles in the industry. They use high-quality Modus 3-grade carbon fiber, which gives them the best strength out there. They are five times stronger than premium aluminum poles and half the weight, so they glide through the water. And best of all, they're handmade here in the USA. The Primate team offers three models of poles in variable sizes, as well as single leg extensions that are compatible with any pole model, which will allow you to extend the length of your pole up to 40 feet. They also pride themselves on offering the best customer service possible to their users, which means that every pole comes with a one-year warranty that covers any and all manufacturing or workmanship defects. We've seen them with their customers, and let me tell you, that is top-notch customer service. The guys at Primate are offering $10 off to our listeners when you use the code PoolChasers10 at checkout. That's PoolChasers10. Please check them out by clicking the link in the write-up below. You talked about your your growth and growing fast, and you mentioned to me the other day that that was kind of one of the hardest things for you to kind of overcome. Um, we had that same kind of issue when we ran Brothers. So what what kind of you tell us about that, and then what you guys kind of do to overcome those challenges? Yeah, I mean, when you're going from you know, let's just say with the eight accounts, and then going from eight to three hundred there, um, it, it, even if it's with the same customer you know, you still have the same issues coming up. Um, you know, now, now you've got employee, you, you go from your being the one man show and you know, doing everything you need to do. You bring someone else on. It kind of teaches you a little bit of, you know, not that the, my wife was in the HR arena for a long, long time. So 
we had no issues with HR stuff. Um, I was in a leadership position for a long time, had employees up to 3,000 people. So that wasn't an issue. It was more along the lines of the day-to-day -day operations of, okay, I'm at this pool. I've got this issue going on. Well, I'm at a pool right now. Let me finish up and I'll call you back. Um, now take that and it's going pretty smooth. And now let's just multiply that a hundred times on top of someone and two guys trying to do it. And you got, you know, you got your wife in the back on the, on the back office going, Oh my God, you guys are killing me. The phones, the phone is ringing off the hook. Um, so it's like, and, and we don't want to turn anything away because we're ready. We're, we're, we're rocking. We're, we, we can get up to five, 600 accounts easy. I can bring on two more guys. Um, but we didn't want to work the guys to death. Um, but it just, it just, it just expanded like that just within a three to six month period. And it's, it's mind blowing because a lot of guys were like, Oh God, I would die to have that. Give me that. Give, give it to me. I'll take it. I'll take everything you got. Yeah. That's great. Until it's it, until you've got it and you, you didn't work your way up to it. It was just kind of thrown in your lap or, or you just kind of walked into that wall and, and then you're just like, Oh my gosh, Oh my gosh, Oh my gosh. And it, it, numbing another mind numbing experience and stuff. And I just, and when we got up to like 500, I said, listen, we got to stop right here. I said, my, the techs, you were wearing the techs out. You're going to burn them out. You're burning me out. Um, I said, we've got to, we've, we've got to get, get rid of some of these accounts. And sure enough, I called a couple of guys said, Hey, could you use some pools here? We're okay. Great. I've got this pool over. I got four here, four there, four there. All right. You'll take those. Okay, great. Now, you know, and back then it really wasn't, it wasn't, bad giving accounts away and these were happy customers i said listen as long as you can take care of these customers they've been our customers since day one and um they've been with us for a few years now just take good care of them we'll, we'll, we'll do the pass off real easy and nice and everybody's happy um th that 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 in, that in itself had maybe an 80 to 90 percent success rate there were the customers that just you know no matter what the other person did they weren't going to please them um but yeah so going back to the the, the, the growth of that yeah, just trying to manage that and, and not just the employees, but the paperwork and, and the, the back end finances of that and making sure, you know, at the time we were dealing with superior and Gorman. So we had invoices coming in from two different, <laughs> two different places. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, Anita would start to reconcile some of the books and she's going, okay, why are they charging us 20 cents more per gallon on bleach than these people? I'm like, well, you need to make that call. <laughs> so, you know, um, but yeah, so once we started clearing out some of the accounts and giving a lot of, giving a lot of them away, um, it definitely got easier, more manageable. So, you know, when people say, Hey, I, I would love to, I would love to have that problem. You, yeah, that's great until you have that problem. You know, how did you decide which ones you were going to get rid of? Were you trying to tighten the routes up or what were you doing to decide which ones to pass on? Yeah, that's a great question. And then, and then that was part of it is tightening the routes up. So, I mean, because at the time we were doing pools from St. Petersburg Beach, which is 40 minutes um, west of us, to Riverview, which is 40 minutes to the east of us, all the way up to uh, almost, I want to say Trinity, Wesley Chapel area, which is another 40 minutes north of us. So we were, we, we were spread out. So we said, okay, listen, if we're going to do this, we're going to try to isolate everything down to how about let's just do within a 10 mile radius of where we live. And then we'll keep some of the, you know, Emilio lived up in North Tampa. So we'll keep them within a 10 mile radius from where he lived. And I said, we'll keep a couple in Pinellas because that's where Brian lives. And we sat down, figured up everything. And we weren't cherry picking because this person paid 150 a month or this person paid 124 95, whatever we were doing it just, just to make the routes tight. And, and once we got that straightened out, we were golden. Hmm. And what do you think um, when you stopped taking on accounts and besides that, what were you adjusting to be able to handle growing again? Cause we did that a couple of times um, when we talked about it before in the podcast where we, we stopped what we were doing in the growth to, you know, install policies and procedures in certain areas or yes. start writing job descriptions for some people and trying to fix some of the structure issues we had um, that we didn't have time to do because of the growth was too fast, which we always wish we would have time to do that properly. Um, it's cause we were hurting our reputation right. when we were doing that. It wasn't worth it. 
So right. when reviews become a big part of your business and you're trying to bite more than you can chew and you're taking in all this new business and you're not, you know, you're not, uh, you're not doing the work that you said that you would do. You're not showing up on time. You're not calling back and you're just, everything is just a freaking mess. And when you do that, you get bad feedback and then it's just kind of that snowball effect and it doesn't stop. So you kind of have to make that really hard call and say, you know what, we need to like, we need to stop. We need to just focus on, um, we need to focus on our team, our processes, and the customer base that we currently have right now. Focus on them and how we can better serve them. And once we get that figured out, get some more team members, then we can get back out there and do it. But passing up on all those leads coming through is just a really good reminder that you need to get your shit together and and get it. Because that's the way I think we always thought was like, dude, like this is, I hate this. Like we're just yeah. passing and the, it and up. The phone's still ringing off the hook right now. Yeah, you know, yeah. but you got to do what you got to do. Um, and some people are like, like I'm not going to pass this up. And it's like, well, you know, if you can get through it, if it's worth it, then you know, more power to you. But you know, if that reputation is that important to you, and that's how you've grown your business, then uh, advise otherwise. Yep. Yeah, and then and I lot and a lot of that stuff I I learned too from uh, when I joined the FSPA back in 2014, the Florida Swimming Pool Association. They had a lot of classes, and one of the one of the, one class that made a big impact on me was a class that was uh, being taught in Sarasota by Don Ball, um, who's with our uh, state board of directors, uh, the executive committee. This guy, we were talking about people answering the phone. The biggest the and the biggest issues, even if I don't care how busy you are, I don't care if you're not taking any more clients on, I don't, answer the phone, call people back. You know, our reputation online is good because we, we strive to do everything in our power to make it like that. Um, I don't want a customer, like you said, the, the techs start getting burned out. They're getting sloppy. Customer's going to call you. Well, what are you going to do about it? Well, me as an owner, I've got to get my butt over to their house, figure out what's going on. Um, get it straightened out. Ask customers, everything look good? Are you happy? Yes. Great. Fantastic. Um, but that was another, you know, that was another part of that class. And it was just, it was just a customer, a pool industry customer service class. And I think we should do a lot more of those out here. Um, because it's the, it, that's the biggest problem now switching gears for just a minute in the renovation on the renovation side of the industry. Um, I've got customers saying you're the only one that's, that's actually shown up. I'm like, what? what? They're like, yeah, I've called five companies to come out. I just want to get my pool refinished and my tile replaced. And you're the only guy that showed up. Now, mind you, it's a Sunday afternoon and it's two o'clock, but I, I'm there. Yeah. I said I was going to be there then and I, I show up there. Um, and, and again, it gets back to just just to, just getting back to the basics. And like you were saying earlier, when you grow too fast, you start to lose you start to lose that vision. You, you, you it's, And it's not that you become complacent. It's because you're just you're overwhelmed. And, and if you don't, if you don't put the brakes on, come back, slow down, you know, take a look at the situation and address it. You're just, yeah, you're going to get killed. Your ratings are going to drop on, online. Um, your reputation, the word of mouth is going to spread around quicker than anything else. Um, so yeah, you just, you've got, you've got to suck that pride in and you've got to say, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm in over my head. I've got to stop. I've got to, I've got to push back. And I mean, that's one thing my wife says all the time, honey, you got to push back a little bit. You're trying to take on too much, too, too fast. And you're going to burn yourself out. And I said, yeah, you're, you've got a good point. So, but that's your job as a, an owner, anybody like wanting to become a, build a pool service company, you have to accept that you're not just the technician, nor will you always be just the technician. You have to learn to, um, really build processes, even if you're backed up on calls and you got to call them all back. You have to make a list of all the things that are consuming your time. And you know that it's like, oh man, because there's too many people that are probably reinventing the wheel every time they got to call somebody back and talk about a certain situation. There's only so many ways a conversation can go. And it's like, you get done with a call and you feel like you nailed it in terms of use the right 
you know, verbiage and how to explain how you can't do something or who you recommend or whatever it may be. It's like, make note of that so that when you're making these calls, it just becomes second nature to you. And you have that confidence that, yeah, I can knock out 10 callbacks or, you know, my team is seeing what I do and I have to teach. Like we did that with our office manager. We had, um, you know, a few office managers that we had to train because it's like, you know, build these systems so that, you know, when there's a system in place and people do it and it works and they're confident, it's easy breezy and they're ha- everybody's happy. And you're only going to be as successful as your weakest link that's 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 within your organization. And yep. and if that weak link isn't isn't being addressed and, and guided and coached and trained properly, you know, you're you're just you're just you're killing yourself more. I mean, it takes you, you know, five five, five minutes to spend with someone to to say, hey, I heard that call. Here's what you should, maybe you should have addressed it this way versus, you know, you know, well, thanks, ma'am, click and hang up and stuff. And you catch little things like that when you're listening and walking around the office when you have time to walk around the office. Um, and you do a little coaching session with them. Oh, hey, you were right. You know what? That call went, you know, that, that customer handled that a lot better by talk, telling them this way and things. So, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about when you're talking about just people, just people in the office and the way they're talking to customers. And sure, everybody gets frustrated and everybody gets aggravated but you know just just take a deep breath it's you know it's the pool industry they're they're not going anywhere (laughs) just learn to talk to people but you know what's really really important in what you did and i think what we did well was was filled we filled holes really well i think um you know by putting things in place that that kept their reputation valid and you know by by choosing to answer the phone still when you're growing or when you think you're too busy that that has a lot of impacts. Um, one on the industry itself, because you know the way that the outside world looks at this industry. You know, if you're not, if it always answers the phone, or you're the fifth guy they've called, and you're the only one to show up, that has a really, just a really bad taste in these people's mouths about our industry. So, for one, to raise the level of the industry, you know, answering the phones and at least giving them good customer service, whether you can take it or not, is a big help. But also, when when we were growing, when and we had to take a take a step back and stop what i think what you know by doing that and finding finding different pool professionals that could fill those voids for us and take on clients for us and figure out how to help those customers because we knew at one point we were going to be wanting to grow again and when you're by doing that and continuing to to keep that funnel rolling you allow yourself to when you're ready to grow again then you can grow again you're still going to be getting those clients coming in because if you stop answering the phones or you make it a shift where where that your, your reputation goes bad or drops down, then when you're ready to grow, you're not going to be able to grow because mm-hmm. you're not putting these things in place that allows you to keep that reputation and keep that, you know, those customers rolling in. Right. 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 Yeah. And, and, and that's exactly right. They're just going to, yeah, don't call those guys. They don't call you back. They never, they, you know, they're the rude and things like that. And then, you know, get, getting back on as far as filling the holes, it's one, one good thing that, professionally in the industry, we've got a great reputation of treating our employees right. We're treating them very good. We take very, very, very good care of them. Those are what we tell the guys um, and the girls that you, you guys are the face of the company. You guys are what makes or breaks us. Not me out here talking to somebody, not Anita sitting behind the phone answering a call here and there. It's you guys that are that are, that are are the face of the company. And, we're, and you've got to treat your people good because – they're, they'll find some. If you don't treat them good, somebody else will, and then now your reputation starts to suffer even more because you're, you've got a lot of turnover. Um, I mean, I, I hear, I hear. I mean, I'm sure you guys did too. When you go to the distributor, you're hearing horror stories of the way that people are getting screamed at, yelled at. They're they're being called out on stupid little things, and it's just unacceptable. It's totally unacceptable. For sure. Our passion to seek pool industry knowledge and being able to share that knowledge with you is the reason we started Pool Chasers. Turns out Pentair has several ways for you to gain knowledge as well. Take, for example, the Pentair Master Service Program. This is a program designed to recognize dealers, service technicians, and other pool professionals for completing desired training modules. It gives you the tools you can use to troubleshoot Pentair installations in the field and become a master of Pentair product knowledge. Be rewarded for educational activities designed to enhance your Pentair knowledge as you move through the certification levels. With three levels to work through, becoming a certified Pentair professional has never been easier. It's training that rewards you and your business. But the real value comes from building your confidence in the field to ensure the customer loyalty you need to keep your business growing. 
We encourage you to check this out. So to become a certified Pentair professional today, visit PentairPartners.com or click the link in the write-up below. You know, rolling in, talking about other pool companies, you know, one of the coolest things I know about you is that you're a part of the Tampa group. Can you tell us kind of what that is and what you guys designed it to do and, you know, how it's been helpful to you? Yeah, so the the Tampa group um, was put together about a year and a half ago, um, and it's a consortium of sorts of different pool professionals. We've got guys that specialize in heaters. We've got guys that specialize in automation, guys that specialize in renovations, guys that specialize in everything, got, um, cleaning maintenance owners that are just phenomenal. That you've got a problem with something, and you know, sure, a lot of us have, a lot of us came up cleaning and stuff, but we don't, there's all kinds of new things coming up. So we've got guys that, that are, that stay on top of that. Um, I don't know if you guys know Dick a bear. I know the name. Yeah. Talk to yeah, him. Dick a bear is a, uh, uh, he's a lead, a living legend. He, we, we compare him kind of like with, uh, with Chuck Norris here. in the <laughs> <laughs> So, but, uh, Dick, Dick has been very, very good to this industry. Um, an absolute phenomenal teacher, um, some refer to him as, uh, you know, uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi of the, of, of the Tampa group. Oh, man. Um, the, the Tampa group, again, a, a consortium of professionals that we all help each other and we all keep each other in the backyard or in, in a backyard. There's no leader of this group. There's no manager of this group. There's no president of this group. We're, we just all get together once a month, um, do some training, have some manufacturers come in, help out with some training there. And, the number one goal is to find other people to bring in and, and just make the, and just make the industry a better place to where we can indirectly reach out to other people to help them. If we overhear conversations at a, uh, at a distributor and we hear them having some issues, we can t- go and talk to them and say, Hey, you know what I would do in that situation? Um, get to know them. Um, so, and, and a lot of people say, well, that's unheard of. You guys, that you're crazy for having that. Well, no, we're not competing with each other. We'll never compete with each other. We're, there's enough of us in the group that that's that spread out through the entire Bay Area that where, sure, I'm going to come across somebody's customer, and if, and if they've already been there, I'm going to say, listen, you need to reach back out to them. They're 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 great people. I will not compete with them um, because my price is going to be the same exact price as theirs, and they're probably treating you just the same way I'm treating you. Oh yeah, you're right. So, um, but yeah, we get a, we get a lot of uh, we get a lot of slack from that from a lot of other guys saying, "How can you guys have this group and 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 function like this? That's unheard of." No, it's not. If you get together, you sit down, you talk about things that, that's going on, um, you communicate with each other, you meet, you try to meet once a month or whenever you can. You're going to make the industry better. Bottom line, right? And I mean, we're all we all have a little bit of competition to some degree, but mm-hmm. wouldn't you rather be on on those terms where like maybe your competitor is saying good things about you because you guys are a part of, you know, um, a group where you're helping each other out. I mean, I know I would, cause you don't know what somebody else could say that right. isn't in something like that. They can make up whatever story they want, or even if they've just heard about something, there's so many times that people have, you know, talked about other companies and come to find out they're actually pretty awesome. The person telling the story was the problem. Right. Yes. <laughs> it just uh, yeah. takes a little yeah. time for all that stuff to come back full circle. Yeah. I think uh, we see that and we do see that all the time. And, you know, we, 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 and we make it, uh, we make it, uh, we, we say we're not going to talk bad about anybody. So, you know, if somebody's saying, you know, ABC, you know, pull pros over here, did this or did that. I'm going to say, you know, I'm going to come back and say, I, I don't know of anything about that. I've never heard anything bad about them. Um, you know, that's, that's your perception. But we're not out here to badmouth other pool professionals ever, ever. So um, I, I, I just we I just can't figure out why other people aren't doing this throughout the rest of the country because it's great. It's absolutely great. I think what you're really doing is is providing your customers and their customers with even better customer service because you know, you're, you're putting the professional in the backyard. You know, if you're not a professional, at a certain aspect of what you're doing, if you have a, 
you know, friend or colleague that does that better or is more professional and can do it the proper way, you know, you're just giving those customers a better taste in their mouth of the industry in general and giving them a better experience because, you know, it's not going to be a half-assed job of, oh yeah, I kind of know how to work on heaters. Let me patch this together. But if you got a guy that works on heaters and you can work out your deal between you two and, and he does the heaters for you, like that just gives your customer a much better experience and the industry a better name. Yeah, because you're you're only as good as the person that you referred, and you're right. and they're going to look at. So if you referred some sh- some some shyster out here, well, guess what? Now that customer is going to associate you with being a shyster. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, For sure. So that yeah, that's the other thing is you know when when we when we send each other into the backyard, we know, hey, Lewis is going to be here at this time. Bill's going to be at there at this time. Doctor J is going to be here then. We know it's going to get done. And we, we can feel confident about referring each other there versus, you know, oh, hey, that guy you referred never called me back. Um, then the other guy you referred me to ended up charging, overcharging me for something. And, I, and he owes me money. I'm like, oh, my gosh. So, yeah, yeah, but, yeah getting back to that, ref, yeah, you're only as good as, as, as the people that you refer. And it's really good for your peace of mind, too, as, as a business owner, knowing that, you know, your customer is being taken care of. That's, that's a big piece that's overlooked, I think. You know, a lot of people struggle with, you know, worrying all the time. And if you put yourself in a situation where you have those people to lean on, you know, as an owner, when you have 400 things going on, that's one less thing you have to worry about. That's, that's really good to have that peace of mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and even with customers. So let's say I've got a maintenance, uh, I've got a maintenance client and um, I remodeled their pool. And, but now I'm so slammed that I just, they're, they, they're like, oh, hey, can you, what, can you do something to set me up with a variable speed pump or some automation to turn the lights off and on automatically? Well, and, and perfect example, we are, I'm two weeks out on a lot of stuff right now. My repair tech can't get to it. Um, I can't get to it. I make a phone call to Luis Jimenez with Pinnacle Pool and Spa. Hey, Luis, I've got a client that that's a maintenance customer of ours that we just did a remodel on their, on their pool. They need automation. I can't get to it. When, when is the soonest you can get to it? Oh man, I can be there Thursday. Great. Uh, I'm going to have them reach out to you, uh, introduce yourself and go ahead and run with it and get it going. That happens all the time. Then I get to the customer's house, check up on a couple of things. We're like, Oh God, Lewis was so great. We love him. We made him tea and cookies and things. And Oh, look, he showed us how to do everything on our phone. I'm like, that's great. That's, that's exactly why I sit in here. Um, they're like, we know you're busy and things. I go, well, I'm never too busy for you, but if we want to get it done and get it done in a timely manner and get it done right. Uh, and even if I don't, if I can't do it, I'm going to find, or I've got the person that can get it done for you. Uh, right. that's, that's a great feeling when you're walking into a backyard, that's really your backyard, but yet you've had one of your, uh, someone from your group come, come into that backyard and the, the customer's like, it, it's nothing changed. Right. Yep. You got a bunch of good apples working together. You know, that's, that's yep. good. Cause if a bad apple comes into that group, they're going to be found really quick. So, you know, yeah. you got a bunch of good yep. ones. And we do, uh, we, we do some extensive, uh, research on anybody that we're interested, uh, in pursuing to come into the group. We, they're, they're vetted nine ways to Sunday and everybody in the group gets a say as far as, Hey, do you like this person? How have you had any dealings with them? Any bad things that you've heard? Um, so yeah, once in, and like I said, we were, we're constantly recruiting people to come into this group because the more, the merrier, uh, we don't care if there's a thousand of us out here, there's, there's more than enough work. Um, there, there's not, there's, there's never, ever going to be any kind of, you know, competition going on. It's just a, this gigantic group of people just getting together, trying to help each other and trying to, and trying to make the industry look a lot better and get rid of this, you know, this nasty stigma that we have out here. Right. And how can people get involved? Um, we'll find you <laughs> because, you know, everybody talks at the distribution center like, Hey, have you heard, have you heard about uh, Mike over at uh, so-and-so pools? This guy is like phenomenal. He's really, really good. Uh, we'll run into them and we'll see them at training classes. We'll see questions that they're asking any feedback or help that they're giving to a group. Word gets around. I mean, it's, it's not a really large area of the Tampa Bay region. So word gets around if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And if you're trying to do everything you can to help other pool professionals, then we want you to be a part of that group, for sure, part of our group for sure. 
Okay. So no website or anything like that? No, 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 no. There's no, like I said, there's no website. There's no, nobody's the, the, the manager or the leader of the team. We're just, we're just a group out here looking for other people to bring in, um, to just help, to help us and help the industry. Very cool. Yep. So you're also, um, the president of the FSPA Tampa Bay chapter. You want to share, um, a little bit more about the organization and why you got into it? I got into, so I got into the Florida Swimming Pool Association back in 2014. Um, I needed, I wanted to learn more about the industry. Uh, I wanted to learn not just, you know, how to fix pumps or anything like that. I wanted to learn more about the industry as a whole. What, uh, what does the end, you know, what, what does the FSPA do for its members, for the organ or for the industry and lots of education, lots and lots of education. Uh, a lot of legislative issues that we're dealing with up in Tallahassee with, with helping the industry. Um, I mean, I could probably go on, that's a whole show in, in and of itself. So, um, but just overall, just helping the industry, helping the pool professionals that are out here right now become more educated. And, and, and we're, we're actually shorthanded on a lot of our, uh, you know, skilled labor areas, construction, remodeling, tile, um, steel, sh- shooting the gunite. I mean, it's just, we've got a facility that we're putting together down in Sarasota right now. Um, we've attended, I've attended one class down there so far. Love it. So the more training and education that we can bring to the industry, the better the industry is going to be in the long run. Very cool. And you guys have uh, kind of more business education. Do you guys have that as well? Yes, there's business education. There's so the pool show that's coming up, uh, everything under the sun that's coming up February, I think it's 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th in Orlando. A lot of classes are there, and and, uh, and a lot of it is for there's classes on how to put a contract together, there's classes on you know filing liens and having you know having to deal with a lien, a lot of construction management classes. So, you know, it's pretty much everything that, that. as much as you want to try to get to know and learn in the industry, it's there at the show. And it's there from the Florida Swimming Pool Association as a whole throughout the year. Nice. And does FSPA have a website? Uh, yes. Uh, FSPA's website is floridapoolpro.com. Perfect. No super secret association. Uh, <laughs> no, just, no secret no, handshake. super secret handshakes there. Um, <laughs> secret handshakes. Yeah. Illuminati of He-Man the Woman Haters Club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no golden. Uh, <laughs> no golden pool poles. <laughs> you see a black robe coming towards you. Yeah, right. You've been chosen. I got to I got to I had this question earlier that I skipped over, but I want to I want to hear it because I read the story about you. Um, you know, in the dog and a pint of blood in your customer's house. Mm. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more yeah. about that? That's pretty, that's pretty crazy, man. Ouch. Oh my God. So yeah. So the, um, I was doing a remodel up in new Tampa and I was coming up to drop off the a sump and some flex hose and stuff to, because we had just drained the pool down. I pull up first thing I pull up and there's water all over the front yard. I mean, the city is there. The neighbors are outside. I'm going, Oh my God, what happened? Please don't tell me it's related to the pool. <laughs> so, I, so I get up to the yard and the owner, he's like, Tony, don't worry. It's just a water. It's a, our pipe broke. I'm like, oh, God, thank God. Thank God. Thank God. He goes, but you're going to have to go through the house. So I've got a sump in my hand. I've got flex hose over my right shoulder. Um, I said, fine, I'll just go through the house. So I get, I get through the house. Now they've got this, they've got two gigantic, like 180 pound labradoodles in the house. Okay. Um, love the dogs, had no issues with the dog. Um, so I'm walking through the house. The one dog is, has its mouth on the bottom of the flex hose and she's chewing on it and stuff as I'm walking. So I get to the sliders. I go to open up the sliding glass doors and I turn this way or I, I turn a little and the hose slides out of the dog's mouth and it's right. It, the hose is hanging right next to my right calf. And sure enough, she, I guess she thought she was going to go chomping back down on that hose and, and chomped a chunk into my leg. I had to literally lean down and pull her bottom jaw out of my calf. Oh. And right then and there, I saw blood start squirting everywhere. So 
I'm trying to put my hand on it to try to just kind of stop the bleeding. Cause I mean, it's going, I mean, it, if you look down, I mean, it looks, it's like a two, two foot radius puddle of blood. I'm going, Oh my God, this lady's going to kill me. I'm sitting there worried about the customer going to kill me. Right. Her dog buddy. right. So believe me, she's more worried than you. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. She's freaking out. So uh, for, fortunately her father, who was a retired physician was staying there at the time. And he's like, all right, let's get, well, come on. We got to, we, we, we got to put pressure on that. We're going to get you out to the pool deck. So it gets me out to the pool deck. Um, we get most of the bleeding stopped, um, elevated my leg up and we had just, and I think this was right past one of the hurricanes that missed the state or something at the time. I can't remember, but they had like 40 gallons of distilled water in the garage. And he's like, go grab, uh, go grab a couple of gallons of distilled water. And I go, well, what are we going to do? He goes, we've got to get this thing cleaned up. You just pulled a, a canine out of your leg. <laughs> I, go, oh, I was kind of there. And, um, so he takes his pinky finger and sticks it inside of one of the fang wounds. Oh. And when I see his second knuckle go in, I went, oh, my gosh, I'm waiting for him to hit my bone with his finger. And he's and then he pulls it back out in this big chunk of fat comes i'm going oh my god now nothing i don't get freaked out by blood or guts or anything like that but just the fact that the guy was able to put his finger in both of those wounds shows how the jaw the the the, the canine sizes were on this dog um so needless to say he flush it out he he actually spent a, almost an hour flushing it out because he'd flush it out he'd let it bleed a little bit more he'd flush it out let it bleed got it wrapped up um by this time it's dark. I said, well, listen, I've got to, I'm just going to leave everything here. I'm going to head home. He goes, no, you need to go to the, you need to go to the walk-in clinic and get a shot or something. I go, what do you mean? Or something? He goes, well, maybe, uh, maybe a tetanus shot. I said, oh, okay. So I'm on the phone with my <laughs> wife. I get home. The, it's still bleeding now. Um, the bandage that he put on was a, covered a little bit in blood. My wife was freaking out because it was, she said it was dripping blood. Um, changed the bandage. Um, had us a couple of little stu sutures there, made an appointment with my doctor the next day, of course, go in and he's like, holy crap. He goes, all right, let's just put some clean sutures, fresh bandages, give you a tetanus shot and see you later. He goes, can you move and everything? I go, well, yeah, it's kind of sore and it was swollen. I go to the house the next day because I needed to finish hooking my sump up into the, uh, into the drain and the pot and stuff The I'm sitting on the pool deck and the dog comes over and puts her la her head down in my lap and would not leave. It was like she kind of knew what she did was wrong, but she knew it was it was an accident. I mean, it, that's all it was. It was a pure accident, but it was almost like the dog knew. Um, you know, bestest buddies ever. Damn, that is so crazy. Yeah, yeah. good story. Yeah, though. yeah. I still, I still have the scars to show it, but you know that 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 wasn't bad compared to. The, to getting bit on the Achilles tendon by a Chihuahua. Oof, those Chihuahuas oh, that was nasty. Yeah, that, yeah. That, I couldn't walk for almost a week after that. This, I was walking up and I, I was up and running around. I mean, I couldn't, you know, jump in and out of pools and stuff, but I mean, I was still, I was mobile. I could walk around with the, you know, the gaping holes. In my <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, but the Chihuahua, yeah, I was, I was down for that. And if that were me, I get a tattoo of that dude's pinky next to the wound. Oh, yeah, that'd be kind of cool, wouldn't it? Right. <laughs> and it, it was funny is I didn't have my phone with me because I could have videotaped it the whole time, but I'm sure that would have been taken down. But it would have been a great video to have. Yes, it would. Yeah. So crazy. We're going to wrap things up here. Do you have any um, book recommendations um, that you'd like to share with the listeners? Well, you guys got it. You guys got to know that Rudy just just published his new his his novel. Um, <laughs> Blade the Glass. Gonna... You guys read it yet? No, I knew you were going to bring uh, that up. Yeah, you, you know I got to pimp that book out, but uh, yeah, definitely, uh, <laughs> definitely got to check that out. Can it's you a, share? Um, can you share it's it with a vampire book? Yeah, it's a vampire book. Yeah, yeah. a vampire so, book. Yeah, yeah. I'm not good. I'm not talking. I'm not giving any spoilers. You want? You want to know? Read the book. But it's a really <laughs> good book, and he'll be at the show, and hopefully we can get some, you know, get get some autographed uh, copies there. I don't know why um, I'm just picturing like that dog you just talked about in a vampire costume or yeah, right. something like. <laughs> Is that why you don't want to talk about it? Because you're the <laughs> yeah, right? victim. Oh my god. <laughs> um, but yes, other other books that I would probably recommend is like you know back in back in the late '80s, this, the the book Seven Habits of Highly Effective People um, by by Stephen Covey. 
definitely recommend that book. Um, a lot of things in there that'll help you change the way you think, um, the way you react to certain situations and certain conditions. Um, another good book, uh, Bobby Bowden, who was the uh, head coach of the Florida State University Seminoles. Um, great leadership book there. A lot of good sayings, a lot of good things that'll help guide you in, in making you know tough decisions. Um, so definitely two books I recommend there, um, other than, of course, Rudy's book. <laughs> what about guerrilla marketing? You referenced that one oh, too. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, th hey, thanks for bringing that one up. So uh, getting into marketing, um, love marketing. Um, P.T. Barnum, example. I don't know if you guys know P.T. Barnum, Barnum and Bailey yep. Circus. Mm -hmm. They say P.T. Barnum was one of the greatest showmen to ever live. He, well, it's not, he wasn't necessarily a showman. He was a marketing guy. Guerrilla marketing, getting into guerrilla marketing, this teaches you some, some techniques and some tactics that are a little outside of the box. So learning how to talk to people, learning how to, to learning focus words, learning uh, their body language, learning their signals when, when, you're, when you're trying to talk to someone and sell them something. And believe me, I'm not the professional at any of that. Um, but that's definitely a good book. Just, and these are just books that are old books that were written back in the day that still carry a lot of weight today, as far as learning and understanding certain aspects of leadership, marketing, talking to people, things like that. And then, and some of those books have helped me become a better pull pro, because even though I was in marketing for so long, I was more or less training other people to talk to people to go face to face with them. And I would go face to face every once in a while in our industry, you're face to face with your customer all the time. You've got to learn how to talk to them. You've got to learn how to read them. Um, and those books will definitely help you out there. Those are great recommendations. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. For sure. So you're going to be, you're going to be at the everything under the sun show, right? This, I will be at coming. everything under the sun. I'll be posting on Facebook. We've got your show uh friday valentine's day valentine's day you guys do anything special that night between 5 30 and 7 yes hanging out with you at <laughs> uh yeah we'll have to bring some champagne sneak in some at the FaceTime theater shop playhouse yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no that's gonna be a good one man we're interviewing lucas um from lucas Agoons. that's a that's a cool one oh, lucas Co is it cogden right cogden, yeah yeah we've been looking forward to that one for a long time so he's now where, where are you guys gonna be are you uh, is that gonna be the next podcast or are you interviewing him there no that's gonna be the one there in Florida. Get out of town, really? Yep. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. So. I'm going to have to have a little chat with him. Because, <laughs> uh, have you guys ever seen his, tr his his older version of his truck where it said Lucas Lagoon's across the bottom of it? I think so. Yeah. I actually modeled and, and marketing marketed my truck like that because I liked how his logo was towards the bottom of the truck. Oh. So when you see my truck, and whenever you see my truck, I, mine says TampaPullPro.com on the bottom half of the truck because it just looks clean. It's a clean presentation. It looks good. Um, it's, uh, I got that from him. So I'll let him know. I stole that. from him. <laughs> That's awesome. Awesome. That's a good thing. That's cool. Yeah. Oh, it's a great thing. Yeah, definitely. Great cool. thing. But I didn't steal the papyrus font from him. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Tony. Well, you've been a big supporter of us for a long time in the Patreon and other ways. And we really appreciate you and you taking the time out of your day to be on the podcast with us. And we're super, really looking forward to seeing you out there in, in Orlando. So thank you for joining us. Oh, you're very, very welcome. And Hey, thanks for everything you guys do for the industry. You're welcome. All right. Thanks for checking out this episode. If you want to find out more about our guests or the sponsors of the show, you can check them out on the links we have provided in the write-up below. We have also provided links to our social media platforms, so please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Our tag is Pool Chasers. If the podcast has brought you any value, please do what you can to support us through our Patreon page by going to patreon.com forward slash pool chasers. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast to be updated each time a new episode is released. One last thing. If you're not yet in our Facebook group, join it today to be surrounded by like-minded individuals who are all trying to better the industry. Thank you all for the support. We appreciate your time and your ear. See you out there, pool chasers. chasers.